Hello and welcome to the monthly Southwest Drought Briefing. I'm Emily Elias, Director of the USDA Southwest Climate Hub. These monthly briefings emerged during the 2020 Southwest Drought from the Drought Monitoring and Reporting Team of the Drought Learning Network. The network links climate service providers with resource managers and resource managers with one another to increase landscape and community resilience in current and future drought. These briefings will continue as long as there are areas of extreme or exceptional drought in the southwestern United States. I want to take a moment to thank my colleague from the National Integrated Drought Information System, Joel Lippenby. Joel will be moderating the questions at the end of the briefing, and please include the questions at any time in the questions feature. So anytime you have a question from what about for one of the speakers, go ahead and include those. We begin this webinar by respectfully acknowledging the land each of us is joining from today is the ancestral land of indigenous cultures. I believe it's important to provide this acknowledgement because the narratives of this land and region have long been told from one dominant perspective without full acknowledgement of the people who lived on this land before. So today we have two presenters. Uh, the first presenter is Dr. Dave Dubois, New Mexico State Climatologist, and he'll provide a drought conditions update. We also have Anna Weinberg with us. She is the co-lead of the sharing management practices team in, of the Drought Learning Network. She's also a research specialist at the University of Arizona. With that, I'll turn it over to Dave for the drought conditions update. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Emily. Let me uh, get set up here and share my screen. And I think if I can push that button, you can see my screen. And if I push that button, I can see full screen. I just want to do a check. Look okay? Yeah, looks All good. Right. Thanks. All right, let's get rolling. Let's do. Um, let's look at the where we are, and then um, we'll conclude uh, where we're going in terms of the outlook. Um, I think we saw this already, but this is basically the, US, the latest U.S. drought monitor for the uh, southwest. And you can see a lot large areas of D4, D3, all the way to um, areas that don't have drought over in the very far southeast part of New Mexico. However, we're dealing with a lot of long-lasting drought um, across most of most all of, New, of California, the Great Basin, as a matter of fact, um, seeing that. Um, really impacting our um, resources. So let's go a little bit into the climate. Um, I'd like to provide a little, some context over the last year. This is the, the, the temperature average, the mean temperature over the last water year, which was October of um, 20 through September of 21, just ended the water year. And this is the, um, basically the percentile kind of looking at the, um, rankings and so as you can see um this is from the west wide drought tracker is a great resource by the way um over the last water year you can see most all of the all the way from the central new mexico westward much above normal top 10 percent a few areas um, um peppered across the uh, west slopes of the sierra as well as as well as it, some of the areas in southern and uh, across um southwestern Nevada or record warmest across here. Let's look at pre precipitation, same time period. Uh, if I get my, there we go. Um, precipitation over the past water year, um, similar story where we, we received the areas where we've seen the record warm, we're also seeing record dry as well as much areas surrounded by areas of much below normal, bottom 10 percentile. And so we've seen the record driest water year in a lot of places all across. The areas that have been strongly more influenced by the monsoon have been more or less the uh, uh, winters of those. Um, so the far, the kind of the southern third of Arizona, the uh, southeast part of New Mexico, and then eastern Colorado have seen some um, really benefits from the summertime precipitation. Um, you know, we've um, seen some areas that are that much above average. Uh, however, there's still drought that that's lingering even after the monsoon. And that was kind of that was our big concern of going into the monsoon. We had a really dry 
spring and even preceding that um, we've seen so we was we were looking at so how 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 do we what's gonna with that in in mind where are we going from there you know because we've seen um, a, a lot of really dry summers and um, so I mean there we go and I just wanted to mention um, you know we've seen that this is kind of just a here now weather um, you know an atmospheric river Im impacting California in the far in the Sierras this was a uh, precipital water um, loop from from a day or so ago and then looking at the, the precipitation um, resulting of that as of yesterday morning um, areas of um, more than um, eight nine inches of precipitation in few areas more more like three to five in some areas so uh, however but this is localized you know it, it, as you go across the Sierras are still dry across um, and but there's a lot of long-term drought that we, we still have to recover from even though that we get these atmospheric rivers that really dump a lot on the on the coast um, even into the central california all right let me go to the next slide there we go i just want to show a few uh where we are in terms of uh, i only unfortunately i just showed i'm just going to show the reservoirs in a, a few areas i can't show all of them uh, but just showing the rio grande um, some of the larger reservoirs here um, we're really right about 6% full over, if you, if you go over on the left side in the Rio Grande uh, Basin, um, 6% in both Caballo and Elephant Butte. So very, very low. Um, similar, um, not as bad on the Pecos, um, Sumner 14 uh, going down, 66 in Brantley. Um, and if we go further up north in New Mexico, um, the Rio Chama Basin, um, you can see, um, you know, still below i mean we it's kind of indicative of our our runoff from from last year this particular year um so heron at 11 elvado at 29 abiquiu at 41 percent and 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 what the big question is like what's going to happen um for this winter time to to help with help with those all right so i um since we're covering uh um further west and uh, i would want to show some of the reservoir reservoirs along the Colorado um, and as you can see that the big the big um, news we've been looking at is the shortages and along the um, with the Colorado the lower Colorado and so just you know and that is triggered by the, the 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 elevations at Lake Mead right now it's about 1067 feet and that's uh, below the uh, trigger for the the the, sh the level one shortages so that that's so that that trigger was a thousand seventy five. So that's you know as all the news you've been hearing probably um, is is you know what are the shortages and how the how that's going to play out with um, with the users down downstream in um, Arizona with the Central Arizona project. Um, so this is just kind of indicative of what's what's going on with the climate. You know we've we're still seeing very dry conditions with even with uh, um, a good monsoon, um, but there's still a lot of lingering impacts going on. Go to the next slide. So I, I'm just going to show a few of the um, the, the indicators that we've been looking at. Um, this one is a uh, is, is soil moisture. That this, this time of year, you know, the, the 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 growing season is kind of wrapping up. You know, we're keeping the moisture in the soils and kind of storing them through the the cooler parts of the month until we get uh, rainfall, either snowfall. So it's kind of where we where are we starting with this new water year? Um, and a few areas have gotten some some uh, upticks in pre, of um, soil moisture, but there's a few a lot of areas that are very dry. And this is the root zone. So this is the top top one meter from satellite. So majority of New Mexico is still below. Um, there's a few areas along the Colorado Plateau that is above above um, higher percentiles, 80, 90 percentile. But a lot of the Great Basin is still pretty pretty dry. Um, and then we can re re look at compare that. Um, th this is a model from NASA Sport looking at column soil moisture, one month difference. So you can see the the benefits of the of our summer monsoon. Um, but there's still a few areas that we're looking at in terms of it's still drying out in southern Arizona and southern New Mexico. And if we go further uh, back, comparing um, the six months difference, you can see the long-term deficits of of soil moisture as well as the benefits of of our current um monsoonal moisture see in, in new mexico and arizona so th that's that's our good news however you know what what is looking forward um so we've we've gotten 
um, some good uh, vegetative growth this summer. Um, and that's, um, you know, here's the one of the sort of the end of the season vegetation drought response index, veg dry. I kind of look at this to see where are things growing and kind of where, you know, what, watching them come up during the spring and summer. And then as we see the, the temperatures go down, you can see sort of that. Um, s still some green areas in terms of vegetation condition doing really well. Um, and this kind of, I, I do a lot of um, kind of ground truthing and this is some of those areas that we've seen in New Mexico from, and these were areas that are really, that in the past couple years have been very drought stress. And however, there's been a, some good short-term um, growth. However, we're still, um, this is short-term. So we're seeing a lot of still drought in some of these areas, even though it looks green like this, but it's still, to, we're behind in precipitation over a long, longer periods of time. Okay, so let me kind of go on to where we're headed. I've been kind of mentioning that several times. And uh, so we, we, we trigger our, our thoughts, we point our, our, our thoughts toward the, the Central Pacific to kind of tell us, give a little bit of in, indications of what's, what's kind of the, what's our seasonal climbing gonna look like. So we look at um, particularly the Nino 3.4, and I've circled that over on the left side there. That's the, um, region over um, central part of the ocean uh, where we where it's correlated well with the, um, the the changing of the of our storm tracks you know the, our our jet stream so right now we're seeing that cooling off uh, we've had we we've been through a La Nina so that's so that all that blue over on the left side of that Nina 3.4 graph that's our cooling that La, La Nina and then we kind of we kind of got near average and we sort of went into neutral, but we're heading right back into this cooling of that central Pacific area. And that the implications of that are in the next slide. It, that basically brings up the probability of this, of the La Nina re returning. And that's sort of, that's where we are right now. It's it's where they've already triggered the La Nina watch. And that's, that's basically here. And that's continuing on to basically it's going to stick with us and throughout the, uh, the winter and, and then kind of, um, go, go from there in terms of maybe another neutral. Um, uh, El Nino is pretty unlikely at this point. That's the red bars. The probabilities are really low, less than 10% right now. Uh, but basically, we're stuck with another La, La Nina. It's kind of double dipping in this, and that's a lot. Not real good news for New Mexico. As you go for, as you go further into the northern states, North Pacific Northwest is better news for them if you like lots of rain. Um, so, so that kind of goes into our outlook. So this is our outlook, the Climate Prediction Center's uh, official maps of on the left side, the temperature above average for the, the Southwest in, ter in terms of mainly focusing on Arizona and New Mexico. And then um, on the right side is our, our pro pro precipitation probabilities um, showing the the pretty good chances of, of dry, um, drier than average uh, in throughout the whole southern tier states and big, mainly focus in on on southeast New Mexico, most all of Texas, the southern Great Plains actually. And um, so that's kind of what that's the official and that basically is a it, it is sort of is, it's indicative of a, of a La Nina. If you look at other La Ninas in the past, not everyone, they get, some of them are really different, but then you get above average precip in the northern states, Pacific Northwest, and then below um, in the southern states. That's pretty uh it goes right along with that with that la nina and if you go even further in terms of winter time there's our three month outlook november december january it's kind of kind of that that beginning of our building snowpack that's where we really want to in a lot of our areas and all the way from the sierra all the way to the um, southern rockies um above average uh temperature outlook and, the, and the, the, these are even with the new the new normals that um um, it's still above average um, chances, uh, higher chances for above average temperatures. And on the right is still that sticking with us, that 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 dirty La Nina coming back, um, biting us. And, um, you know, there's pretty good chances for below average um, precipitation, which doesn't bode well for snowpack in their southern basins. Um, and equal chances, uh, which is our, kind of the, the positive of this, equal chances in, in the Colorado, upper Colorado. So that's that's the... The uh, one good thing I can mention with this with this uh, outlook is, you know, it can go either way for our our, our uh, upper Rio Rio Grande and and Colorado. So we desperately need that, um, but we're still seeing that 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 good chance of that 
La Nina uh, impacting uh, most of New Mexico in terms of warm. And so I will, um, that's basically almost, I was all I was going to share other than uh, drought outlook, which is my last slide, um, kind of totally jives with it. You know, that, that chocolate area, that's a persisting drought. And then all the other areas that are that, that brown, uh, yellowish, um, if it's not in drought now, it likely will develop um, throughout the rest of the calendar year. So this is the drought outlook from, from now all the way to the end, the end of J January. So that's where we're heading. Um, we'll, we'll keep an eye on this and see where, see how the La Nina really pans out in terms of the, uh, are we tracking those um, storms further north or are they going to still be impacted by the, you know, what's going on in the Pacific? So that's all I have. Uh, whoops. So sorry. I put me, uh, <laughs> Um, I will go ahead and transfer back to Great. to you, and um, that's that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dave. Um, looking a, a little bit concerning at the moment, um, but we're lucky because today we have the co-lead of the Sharing Management Practices team with the Drought Learning Network here, Anna Weinberg, and she'll be talking with us about some effective management practices to cope with drought. Over to you, Anna. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, and thank you all for having me today. I'm excited to talk to you. Uh, yeah, as Emily said, I'm the co-lead of the Sharing Management Practices team of the Southwest Drought Learning Network. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what we do, what we've done, um, particularly in coordination with CCAST, the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox. So the drought, uh, you know, Emily briefly discussed what the Drought Learning Network was uh, before, but uh, maybe a little more detail. It was created in response to the exceptional drought of 2018 across the Colorado Plateau, which had really dire implications for a lot of things, agriculture production, water management, um, and human and wildlife well-being. Um, and it really stressed the importance of sharing lessons learned so that experience can be a tool for resilience to current and future droughts. Uh, while it was initially established by these four entities on screen, um, many more organizations and agencies have joined with nearly 100 people in the network to date. So since then, we've organized into five topical teams, each with their own unique focus and goals. Uh, and these are listed in the outer circles of this diagram, which is meant to demonstrate how knowledge and resources are shared both between managers and teams, but also across the teams. Um, the learning, sharing, leveraging happens in multiple directions that increases knowledge about uh, you know, how to deal with drought, what drought conditions look like on the ground, um, and hopefully leads towards drought resilience um, among those involved and the communities that we serve. So a team to note particularly is the Sharing Management Practices team. Uh, this team is focused on showcasing transferable stories of drought adaptation, mitigation, and resilience actually happening on the ground among resource managers. Um, and these stories are identified through folks in the Drought Learning Network, uh, our partners, and just all the people that have ears to the ground in our communities about you know, how drought is affecting um, us in different ways. The sharing lessons and knowledge happens through actionable and accessible outlets for other folks in similar situations. So the sharing management practices team had a goal of sharing lessons learned from dealing with drought, but needed a platform to do so. So instead of recreating the wheel, the Sharing Management Practices team partnered with CCAST to showcase these stories of drought adaptation um, through case studies. So CCAST, um, who I directly work with, officially launched in 2017 uh, because folks in resource management um, were saying that they wanted to communicate outcomes, lessons learned from relevant research and on the ground actions in terms of conservation and restoration more generally, uh, faster and more efficiently, but were lacking effective platforms to share those lessons. So CCAST um, was developed in direct response to this need. So one of the most direct ways that CCAST does this is through the development of case studies. Uh, case studies are again focused on uh, lessons learned in actionable science from on the ground resource management activities. Uh, 
the case studies showcased on CCAST were more broadly focused on a whole variety of topics within conservation uh, management, but particularly for this group and what uh, work I'm particularly focused on and prioritize is our case studies on water resources management and drought and climate adaptation. Um, case studies act as a really fast communication tool and knowledge source for practitioners. We try to make uh, information really, you know, good and easily accessible and helpful. So we showcase our case studies through a publicly accessible online library that has a multiple options for how to engage with that uh, library of case studies through dash dashboards and tag based search options, which I'll, I'll show in a little bit. Um, we're really excited, get really excited about these case studies because they provide an opportunity to share outcomes from conservation and management actions that might not otherwise be easily available. So again, we're really focused on working with people on the ground, farmers and ranchers, managers, uh, practitioners, what have you, um, who are really putting um, into work, you know, different approaches and management actions and tools for addressing drought adaptation um, and management, for example. So we try to provide a platform for those folks who have this really big wealth of knowledge, uh, but maybe not have, but maybe don't have really good uh, channels to share it. We like to provide opportunities for them to uh, share their wisdom with us. Um, finally, the case studies are so showcased through online content in ArcGIS story map applications, uh, as well as each having a two-page summary handout uh, to make, especially as an outreach material for things like in-person workshops and conferences. So in this partnership, uh, CCAS provides the infrastructure, such as the templates for outreach emails and case study writing, um, a streamlined and modular process for taking ideas and interviews with these folks who are doing work on to the ground and making them into actual products, um, and then providing this platform to house all of these case studies to make kind of a one-stop shop for all this, uh, for all your information needs. Um, and on the end of the sharing management practices team, the, this team brings a lot uh, additional minds and hands to increase capacity. So CCAS is really developed in a modular um, pr modular way so we can really uh, easily bring in additional capacity from folks who have you know the hands to help develop case studies or bring new ideas so the drought learning network is full of agencies and organizations that have intern hiring and support capacity already in place and we really take advantage of that most of our case studies are written by students and interns so uh, this provides an opportunity for these early professionals to gain access to an awesome network of colleagues, um, to build science communication skills uh, while helping us get important information out to folks. So the sharing management practices team, again, also helps identify case study priorities and needs based on what we're hearing in our specific circles and communities, because we're really focused on making uh, all these case studies very relevant um, and pertinent to the most immediate needs by uh, communicated by our partners. So this is a screenshot of what the CCAS case study dashboard looks like, and I'll drop links in the chat uh, at the end for you to access any of this stuff. Um, but the, the dashboard, again, shows our total number of case studies, any new ones that have been developed, as well as a whole variety of ways to filter uh, case studies, so by topic, stressor management, strategy, what have you, or if you were looking just by geographic location, you have full ability to cycle through all those options. Um, for example, if you're interested in looking at case studies focused on the topic of water resources, you just select that filter and those options will pop up on the map. Additionally, we have the option uh, or give the option to search through our case studies by tags. So these are tags that we populated on our end. Um, for example, if you're interested in case studies focused on drought or uh, high hydrology, groundwater, uh, also you know, different ecosystem features like riparian systems, montane systems, we have the ability to search through our library in that way. And this is a uh, screenshot of what one of the online case studies looks like. So all our case studies follow the same format, uh, again, prepared in these online GIS story maps with the same six tabs that take you through the case study background, key issues, goals, uh, project highlights, and especially the lessons learned. So again, that important information about, um, okay, we did this thing on the ground, 
what actually happened, what worked, what didn't work, really, you know, helpful information to pass on to folks and what is, you know, one of the real gems that we hope people get out of these case studies who read them. We want these to be a helpful resource to resource for all of you all who want to learn what else uh, people are doing on the ground. Again, these case studies then are always have an associated two-page handout. So this is that handout for that same case study, which is the information condensed down in a more easily uh, shareable format. So the Sharing Management Practices team, um, in partnership with CCAST, has made a really uh, a lot of really great progress so far. Um, through CCAST, we've developed eight Sharing Management Practice-led case studies with over 2,000 total views, um, in addition to many, many other drought-related case studies that CCAST has developed. Um, we currently have six uh, student interns through the Southwest Climate Hub, the National Drought Mitigation Center, and the Virtual Student Federal Service Program through the State Department, who are all developing lots of case studies for us. So we have 11 case studies currently in progress, and we're hoping to double that number by the end of the academic year. Additionally, um, through the Sharing Management Practices team, um, with the Come Rain or Shine podcast, which is hosted collaboratively by the Southwest Climate Hub and the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center, which has a uh, amazing um, library of episodes covering all sorts of things related to urban heat effects, to the mental stress of, uh, you know, being a farmer or rancher dealing with a drought, um, and has had a lot of really great success so far, and I'm really excited about it, and definitely encourage y'all to check those out. Um, and finally, looking forward, we're thinking about all sorts of other ways to engage folks um, with different platforms, uh, through videos, through webinars, um, as well as continuing to develop the case studies and podcast episodes that we are sharing. So that's what I've got right now. Um, thanks so much for your time. And again, you know, we're really interested in uh, you using these platforms and engaging with them. So I'll, I'll drop some links and hopefully you all check them out. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks, Anna, um, for that presentation. And we do have a couple of questions. The first one's not a question. I just before we run out of time, there was a comment from Maureen saying that uh, she strongly recommends the CCAS process. They're developing the second case study for our project, she says. And the process is easy and the products are excellent. Great group to work with. So kudos to you, Anna, and your team. Uh, I agree that the uh, the case studies coming out of your team and being posted on CCAST are excellent. Um, so keep up the good work. Um, Anna, while, while I'm talking to, with you, the, the first question I'm going to direct to you. Um, so the these ideas of case studies came about from the Southwest Drought Learning Network. Are all of the case studies focused in the Southwest region or have you expanded outside of that region? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, a lot of the case studies we've developed um, through the sharing management practices team, I would say are focused in the Southwest, but the whole um, library of case studies, including those focused on drought and water resources cover um, the, the country. So we're not just focused in the Southwest, that's where we were originally based. So if you look at our map, you'll see there's like a high concentration of case studies in Arizona, for example, but we are expanding beyond that um, and uh, increasing, uh, yeah, our kind of national scope. Great, thanks for that. Dave, the next question's from you. Uh, you talked about the, um, we, we had a, a pretty good monsoon. Arizona had a fantastic monsoon. It was a little closer to average in New Mexico uh, for this last summer, but the images that you showed of the reservoirs, the, the reservoirs didn't change that much in New Mexico from the monsoon, uh, which I guess that's not too unexpected. We know that most of the precept comes from winter. Uh, or most of the, the inflow for those storages comes from winter. So Dave, the question is, what would be your ideal scenario to happen this winter for the Southwest? Okay, great, great. It's a great question. <clears throat> yeah, you're, you're, yeah, yeah, it was a good perception in terms of the, um, the, the reservoir didn't really change a lot. I mean, we can get, you know, I've looked, I've kind of looked back on some of the really impactful monsoons um, on reservoirs and yeah, we can get, you know, I've seen um, um, basically like like in 2013, it was the last one I looked, looked at. We had really 
we had a really a monsoonal burst and um uh, we've you know we got like 5000 acre feet of water um coming down the Rio Grande into Elephant Butte <clears throat> um in, in in a matter of maybe two and a half days and so you know, but you have to kind of think about the the you know the storage capacities you know 5000 compared to 2 million um it's it's not a lot i mean I, but that's one you know one rain event but you know we don't usually get a lot of those um so I, I think the ideal um, scenario would be, I mean, of course, we need we need a lot of snowpack. We need a good, you know, that it, it kind of, you know, doesn't look that good in terms of the the temperature. So that's another thing that we're really keen on is not just the probability of the precipitation, but the temperatures, because that kind of tilts our, our um, probabilities in terms of um, more uh, rain as opposed to snow you know we will take whatever precept we can take we that we can get but however it's better if it falls in as snow and keeps it frozen throughout um the the you know starting in the, the water year and um you know we we had um we have some some snow in the higher elevations so f the, in 2020 2021 so far um but i think it's you know we needed a we need a definitely the above average and cooler temperatures that would be that would be my my prayer for for uh, is to keep is to have that however it it's um the cpc is uh not doesn't look like that's going to be the case i mean there it's warming warmer and um drier right now so but you know where i i stand in terms of what i want but not always what we get great thank you dave um, I know that we passed the top of the hour. This it, we're usually scheduled to go only till uh, just half an hour. I've got a few more questions that came in. If you don't mind staying for an extra five minutes or so, Dave and Anna, uh, would you mind answering a couple more questions? Sounds good. Sure thing. Okay. Um, Anna, the next question is is for you. What proportion of the case studies are on public land versus managed private lands? Ooh, that's a good question, which I haven't gotten before, but um, I would, it's it's definitely a mix, but usually our case studies focus on some federal or state agency partner, at least. So I think we have, for example, several case studies focused on uh, private land in terms of uh, bullfrog eradication in Arizona, but often the Arizona Game and Fish Department is a significant partner on those case studies. So it, more so, I will uh, not answer your question, but answer it by saying that we usually have multiple partners um, with, uh, you know, focusing on, because these are large collaborative uh, conservation projects, often it often involves multiple land types for the kind of case studies we share. Okay, great. Thanks for that explanation. We've got one more for you, Anna. Are you open to open to adding case studies from other groups on your site? For example, the Water Utilities Climate Alliance has a practice of preparing case studies, and your program would be a great place to expand the their visibility to other users. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, we're definitely interested in it, and we've had these conversations with partners in the past who are also developing case studies. So um, I really encourage you to shoot me an email um, and I'd love to chat with you about it. I don't know if I can drop my email in the chat, but maybe uh, Joel and or Emily, if you could do that, that would be great. Uh, yeah, we'll work on that. Emily, maybe I, I, I'll test that with you as I'm reading the last question. This is gonna be the last question and it's gonna go to Dave. A soil moisture still appears to be low across the Southern Rockies. Will this affect spring runoff in 2022 the way that it did in early 2021? Yeah, that's a great, another great question because that's one of the things that we look for is the preceding soil moisture before, um, yeah, as it develops, you know, and if we, we look at time series and um, how has the monsoon affected what's going to happen in the following spring. And so we, that really makes a difference. We, uh, we see the snowpack and we see the, the soil columns. If it stays um, wet and cool, it'll likely will stay some of that will stay there throughout the, the winter time as it, as the the top becomes frozen it kind of makes a um you know kind of seals it for the rest of the year however if we see a a drying um top meter and that's not a good sign because then when the 
when the runoff comes and say, depending on where, what latitude you are, um, come, come um, uh, melting of the snowpack, it's going to take a, it's going to soak up a lot of that, that moisture coming in, um, in this, in the stream beds, the river, as well as the, the, the um, surrounding vegetation areas. So it's, it's um, really makes a difference. That's why I like to focus this time of year, uh, beginning of the winter is looking at, at, at a um, soil moisture. And we really need a lot more soil moisture measurements. Um, we have some great satellite products, but it's nice. It's always great to have um, actually in situ measurements that we can compare. We you know, rely on a lot of this um, scan, the USDA scan network, the soil climate um, network. Um, but you know, if, if anybody knows of any other high, eleva high elevation ones other than the Snowtel, um, let, please let us know. Great. So can we add that to your your wish list or your your list of things you're praying for is a wet autumn leading into a cool and wet winter? Absolutely. All right. I'm going to wrap it up there, Emily. I'm going to pass back to you to close up our briefing today. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, thanks everyone for staying a bit longer. Our next drop briefing will be on November 23rd at 1 p.m. Mountain Time. And uh, thanks to Anna Weinberg and to Dave Dubois for sharing their information. This concludes our webinar.